Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are going through Louis Sullivan's Kindergarten Chats. This is part three or part four? I forget now. We're gonna start with imagination and go up to part four. Okay, part four, uh, going from imagination to responsibility. So it's going to be a series of presentations, uh, starting with Sherry Trasinski, then Rob Trasinski, then Maritza, Joya, and Rupali. All right, Sherry. Yep. I'm going to need to share screen in a second. So do you need to do anything for that? Or are we good already? You're good. You can okay. just go ahead and do that. All right, good. So um, I've taken my, well, and Rob has told me again, uh, my appointed role is to always give our architectural history um, and, and updates. So we've got everything that Sullivan is talking about in a broader perspective of what's going on at the time. Um, and so I wanted to explain a little about this chapter door column. Um, it, you've all probably seen the image. It's a tiny little image, maybe an inch high in your book. It's very difficult to find this image. That's about the only one that's out there. And the, um, the live, was it the, which library had it? The Library, of the Library of Congress was having problems uh, this morning, so I couldn't link to that picture. Um, so uh, if you don't have it, it's this column here, if you don't have the book. Um, so he's talking about the Dora column. So um, just so you know, this was a, a, bison, it was a Detroit Bicentennial Memorial proposed in the year 1900. And just again, for historical context, kindergarten chats first started getting published the very next year. So this is fresh, hot off the press kind of thing that he's talking about. Um, and this bicentennial tower was supposed to be 24 feet in diameter. It was supposed to be 220 feet tall um, with a gas light at the top. And in $1,900, uh, it was supposed to cost $1 million, uh, which was an extraordinary amount of money. <laughs> it didn't end up getting built. Uh, but I don't think at the time that Louis Sullivan, well, no, it, I think at the time he wrote this was when they were learning the full implication of the cost of this and decided not to build it. But uh, before I get into some of what happened with that, let me just read the paragraph of... Um, its design. So Sullivan writes, forthwith, they appointed the usual committee. Forthwith, the committee proceeded to sit and think or to deliberate as they may say, as they might say, which is, which same is a shade more deadly than thinking. They thought of an architect far in the East like a morning star. They summoned him, he came, he pondered. Then the committee pondered. Then they all brooded together in conference, as it is said. They, the committee, asked him, the architect, to think of a memorial that should be, that should be expressive, fitting, appropriate, and proper. And behold, the Morning Star dreamed of a Doric column, the largest in the world. So uh, let's share screen and we'll show some of, are you doing here? Let me share screen. Uh, we'll show a few other things. And go to. So, this Dora column was found to be far too expensive. So, instead, they built a sandstone chair. <laughs> um, this cost in $1,900, $1,500 to build, which is probably like thirty to forty thousand dollars in you know in the in uh, 10 20 years ago um so there's it there's an inscription on the back um there is this particular this is what it looked like it's set up on two steps in the city and it was their bicentennial i think in the back it has a sort of relief of the explorers yeah. finding the mm -hmm. uh, finding the, the location um, and then what proceeded to happen um, was that everybody sat on it. 
Um, it eventually became, you can see this isn't that many years later. You can tell by the ages of the cars in the background. This is only about 30 years old by this point. And you can see the, the destruction already. Uh, the, the armrests are quite broken up. Um, it, the top above the pediment there, that curved part at the top is breaking apart. Sandstone's a very porous stone, uh, very susceptible to freeze and thaw cycles. Um, Detroit has a fair amount of freeze and thaw cycles. So maybe it wasn't just, maybe it wasn't a really great material to begin with, but anyway, it became used um, for vagrants. They would sleep in the chair and all sorts of things. It became an issue. Um, and within um, 40 years, maybe 50 years of, of commemorating the city with this monument, go ahead, Ron. It was torn down with sledgehammers. Um, they didn't, th there, there was notification in the newspapers at the time that it was being dismantled and brought to the art museum. But as you could see, <laughs> the method of dismantling, uh, there was nothing ever brought to the art museum. There was nothing ever saved. So the only thing that ever exists now is some of these photographs of it. But um, not to be outdone, um, just about, what are you doing here? Just about two hours away by car today in the little, so we have Detroit up here in the top. They proposed this tallest door column in the world, way down here on this little isthmus in a place called Put-In Bay in Ohio. So, you know, Ohio, Midwestern, it happens everywhere, but especially in the Midwest, the states really are fairly competitive with one another sort of like the city states were in the Renaissance in Italy and things like that. So um, in Put-In Bay, Ohio, just a few years later was this. Now this is the world's largest door column. <laughs> and in this particular case, it was used to commemorate um, Commodore Perry's War of 1812 victory. Um, and it, at the Battle of Lake Erie. So this is right in that battle. This was completed in 1915. hundred years, years after the battle. hundred years after the battle. So not a bicentennial, but clearly the idea of the world's largest column, uh, Doric column would be a, a fitting approach uh, to commemorate something at this point in time. So this was just 10, 12 years. This was designed just a little bit after uh, Sullivan wrote kindergarten chats. We wrote this chapter about Dora Column. Well, and then not to be outdone and to make sure um, you all understand exactly what, how real, what Frank, like, or what, what Sullivan is talking about, about this return of old ideas. Um, then we also have just a few years later, let's Rob's talking. Gonna, keep talking. Keep talking. Yeah. Was um, in 1922, Chicago's Chicago Tribune Tower competition. And this was one of the entries. It did not win. This is the entry by Adolf Laus, who was an Austrian architect. Very, very influential. We still in have Europe. the Doric column up. Oh, go back. No, we have. It's a drawing. Our screen sharing is paused. Okay, why are we pausing screen sharing? I okay, we'll stop share and come back in. Yeah. So I, I can't get a cursor at all. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. From my side and uh, continue. Let's see here. Okay, stop sharing now. Okay. Well, let's resume the share so we can get the last one. Share. Yeah. And we'll go back to Keynote Solve before. And go here. And okay. Yep. Hit play. Okay. So here we are. 
um, the Chicago Tribune Tower competition. Not only was this a competition uh, for uh, the building that the Chicago Tribune Tower was building, and I'll probably get into the competition at some other point while we're in this discussion because it's very influential. Um, it was 1922, but it was also a huge. Um, well, for, for, for readers of the Fountainhead, this is the real life version of the Cosmos Slotnik competition for, yeah, for yeah. the most beautiful building in the world. Which is and it was, actually, it, it was actually marketed that way as the most beautiful building in the world competition. Um, and this was an entry by the Austrian architect Adolf Loos, um, his Doric column, <laughs> bigger, I believe, than the one in Putin Bay, Ohio. Uh, so they would have been one upping Ohio. So from Michigan to Ohio to Chicago, you're cranking it up a little. This was not the chosen entry. The building was not built like this. But in these kinds of competitions, the, um, the non-winning entries are often far more influential than the winning entries. And at that point in time, just about every architect of, their, of any worth was sending in an entry. There were like 262 or something, 200 and some number of entries um, to this competition. Um, there were books published of the entries. Um, a little, te no, I I'll, I'll tease you about that one later. Um, but what's really interesting about this is it's very, very spare building. Adolf Laus was um, an influential architectural theorist, especially in European modernism. But what's really interesting is that he had spent several years in the US from 1893 to 1896, which is right in the middle of all of Louis Sullivan's discussions and artic articles that he's writing. It's about all of the high point of his career uh, working with Adler Sullivan. So he was right in the middle of all of that. And when Adolf Laus traveled to the US, he spent time in Philly. He spent time in Chicago at the World's Fair, the very place that we hear Sullivan talk about. He spent time in St. Louis where a lot of the buildings were. And then he spent a lot of time also in New York. So he then brought his, those ideas that he got from the US back to Europe. It's one of the pathways of modern ideas and architecture that came from the US and jumped shore over to Europe, traveled around and then came back. But anyway, so that is yet another um, example of how important this idea of a Doric column was at this point and how prevalent it was. When he's talking about this chapter, it's not just a one little blip thing it was a major thing he's talking about. Um, and that is all of the slide pictures we have for the day. Um, and then Rob has requested. Um, oh, I'll stop share. Srikant, can you stop share? Rob apparently is unable to. Okay. Uh, give me just a second. The cursor's not working. And the cursor doesn't show up. And the escape. Well, I think I just stopped the chair. Right. Okay, excellent. No, no I can't see anything. Good. Yep, Every, everything is good now. Now we need to go to here. There we are. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so Rob has this. Uh, there were so many things I really wanted to talk about. Um, and so many absolutely wonderful phrases like mental furniture. I mean, <laughs> mental furniture. <laughs> So, um, and Rob's gonna steal, I'll say that, just use that word. He's gonna steal a few things that I wanted to talk about because he tells me that no one else, um, maybe Rupali, I'm hoping Rupali doesn't have the same stories I have, but um, we're in the chapter on the responsibility, uh, the architect and schools. So, and Srikant knows somewhat of what's coming and I promise I'm not gonna tell the whole story. I'm just gonna tell two examples. Um, so here we are on chapter, let's see what number, I guess it's 20. Um, the responsibility, ar the architect and the schools. Um, and I'm gonna read this one, I guess it's two paragraphs. Well, maybe it's actually three. Um, where there is an effect, 
there is surely a cause. We all know that. We see this effect, this phenomenon, this attitude. This cause may seem obscure, but it is not. It is a little one, such a little one. He, this architect, went to school. So it were better if all the architecture schools were at the bottom of the sea. They have no discernible function on land other than to make mischief. Anyone who will take the trouble to investigate the architectural schools will shortly discover that as institutions of learning, so-called, they are bankrupt. If by solvency we mean, we excuse me, if by solvency we assume that 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 what makes for good of the people, not only are they useless to our democratic aspirations, they are actively pernicious and their tendency of operation is a fraud on the commonwealth which supports them. Their teachings are one long continuous imbecility. They are undemocratic to the core of their dried up medievalism, although a democracy pays their bills and houses and feeds them in a land of freedom. They are essentially parasitic, sucking the juices of healthy tissues and breeding more parasites. If an institution whatsoever were to receive healthy lads and after four years of care, return them mentally and physically crippled, broken winged, winded, weak hearted and infected, there would be a hue and a cry but why? Because we could easily see and easily understand. It would speak at once to the heart, to the intelligence. It would be everybody's business. It would create popular clamor. But when the precisely such young men are taken by an institution so-called of learning, a so-called school of architecture, and in four years, are turned out of it mentally dislocated with their vision obscured, hearts atrophied and perverted sensibilities. Who cares and why? Because it is not so easily seen. The social consequences are not obvious. It is nobody's business, but ours. So I have to say this. Yeah, I'm gonna let you have this. I noticed you have two giant exclamation points next to that. Yes. Um, when I first read this, um, you know, I think I've mentioned this a few different times. Every time I read this, I have a different set of markings in the margins. <laughs> this one had two exclamation points in the margins. At the time, I was going through exactly what they were describing in this book. Um, I happily, happily. Um, had some wonderful friends who introduced me to some wonderful books that explained to me what was going on at those architecture schools because had that not happened, I might have been one of my classmates who I slowly watched their brains turn to jello in the four or five years of architecture school. Um, and there's to, and this is this was many years ago, so it's quite possible things have changed from what I've seen, perhaps not. Um, so these are two examples. Which two did you want me to? The chicken, well, chicken bones first. Chicken bones first. Yeah. Okay. So these are two examples of the things that I saw. One of the second example is one I actually went through myself. Uh, the first one I watched from across the building, um, and we refer to it as the chicken bones class. Um, so this was an architecture design course. So if you didn't pass the course, you couldn't graduate. You couldn't get a degree in architecture. And without a degree from an accredited university, you cannot practice architecture. So you kind of pushed. You can, yes, go in a bunch of different, anyway, it's there's other loopholes out, but not so easily. So the class across from my studio class, my second or third year of architecture, um, had a new professor um, who thought it was really important for the students to really feel committed to their design. So they all went to a chicken farm um, as a class assignment. Um, and they all picked a chicken. 
what they didn't realize was about to come um, was that then they were to dispatch of the chicken and pluck said chicken and go to the professor's house and they each prepared a meal of their chicken, which all sounds like, okay, are you teaching chefs? Okay, this sounds good. Then they were proceeded to take, they, they were, what did he say? They needed to, they needed to eat of the food in order to produce the architecture to really understand. They need to become. The they chicken. need to become part of the chicken or the chicken to become part of them. So then they took the bones after, you know, you pick the chicken afterwards, maybe you're making stock, but no, what they were doing is they're taking all the bones and then they cleaned the bones and they brought the bones to school the next day. And in their studio course, they then took the chicken bones and used them as model making parts to design their buildings. Uh, and I just get stunned faces here. Um, and they proceeded to do this kind of reiteration on the, the chicken bones for 15 weeks. So um, when Sullivan talks about the inanity of it all, um, I understand what they're talking about. The other example Rob really wants me to share, I wanted to share the clog dancing story. Or you can do that too if you like. Okay, so the short answer, this is a really short one. I saw a graduate student um, present their graduate thesis, which, you know, this is the culmination of a couple years worth of work, at least a full year um, based on this one particular project they're working on. Um, and the particular school that I was in at that time had a courtyard. So there was a courtyard in the center that all the build, all the classrooms were around it. So when somebody presented, they were in the courtyard and you could line up around the wall at the lower level and see up close, or you could be up above in the studio spaces and watch from above. And we watched as we were in young architecture students, we were required to watch what the graduate students were presenting. And um, a graduate student came out with these big 30 by 40 inch boards of drawings they'd spent a year drawing set them out on the floor. Usually they hung on the walls so the professors could walk around them, but no, he laid them flat on the floor, walked off to the side, took off his shoes, put on a pair of clog dancing shoes and proceeded to clog dance around and on top of his drawings. And that was his presentation for his master's thesis in architecture design. And then, and I kid you not, I stood there dumbfounded while the professors came out and had this serious conversation <laughs> about what was happening. Um, then the third example that I went, and I don't have, I don't have visual representation, no, so I'm gonna try to explain this for you. Um, it was a studio class again and 18 weeks long um, we were not told what our end product was going to be. We were given an assignment each week and told what to do. Um, and it started with, we were to find an object in our dorms uh, that represented movement, like twisting motion or pulling motion or pushing or something like this. So we're all thinking, this is, it's an engineering school. We're thinking this has something to do with structure. Um, I had a skein of yarn that was twisted. So I started with a skein of yarn. Uh, we were then proceeded to do an intensely detailed drawings of this motion, um, which then, but, but we were not told what the next step would be. It was completely not allowed for us. You were not allowed to, to know anything what was happening next. So you had no way to connect what you were doing one week to what you were doing the next or in any possible way to where it was going in the long run. So then your drawing then got chopped into pieces, six pieces and became, we were to mount them on boards that we could make a box out of. And you also had to build them up in but three dimensions? Th well, that's coming. Oh, yeah, okay. Then we took um, and we were take, taking clay and we had to make that, whatever that drawing was in three dimensions, 
on six pieces of wood. So essentially I had to build up from that. Still no clue what this was for. Then, are you ready for this? The next week we had to cut some of the clay away so that we could take that 3D thing and make it the inside of a cube. So each of those boards then became the wall of a cube with that motion inside, Joe's just laughing, I could see you. Then we had to drill a hole through one side of the box somewhere. And I think, oh, I remember the teacher chose where that hole went. So we drill a tiny half inch hole and then the teacher comes around with peep holes. And I don't like, know- like, like from the front door. From the front door peep holes, you know, where you look through and somebody knocks, you look through. Well, if you know, those peep holes have a fisheye lens. So you can imagine twisted skein of yarn chopped in six pieces, built into some weird twisty shape, put back together inside of a box with very little light, and then looked at through a fisheye lens. And you could just about imagine. Then we had to design a chair. We had to draw. We had to draw. The well, lens. then we drew what was inside the fisheye, what we saw through the fisheye lens. And then the next week we had to design a piece of furniture that not only looked like the, that drawing, but looked like it belonged in that environment when we put it inside the fisheye lens. So we had to you know, figure what you did here outside and then you put it inside the crazy box and then figure out that it looks like it belongs in crazy land inside your box, right? And then <laughs> once that happens, we could take our crazy chair from crazy land out of the box. And then we had to build it out of cardboard and glue and no other materials. Cardboard and glue, it had to look like the chair that was inside the box. And whether you passed or not was if the chair could hold your weight. So we had a small, tiny, petite woman in our class who, you know, child malnutrition because she grew up in Czechoslovakia during the Civil War. And we had a kid who could have been playing for the New York Bears who weighed 245 New pounds, New, uh, uh, Chicago, whatever. Who's the Chicago, Chicago, Bears. Chicago, Chicago Bears. Bears, excuse me who could have played for them, who weighed like 245 pounds and we're all trying to build chairs out of cardboard and glue. And you, and you have to lift your feet up in order to pass. <laughs> anyway, so when, when I read what Sullivan is railing against in architecture schools, I think it is actually, unless it's gotten better since then, it was really horrendous. I really truly watched my classmates from the beginning when they started having lucid minds to literally be babbling fools by the time they graduated. Unable to co form coherent sentences. Um, it was quite tragic to watch. Um, and really what that kind of education does is it's eliminating every step of the way, any form of rational thinking, any logical thought, from one class to the next, nothing builds from one another. Um, yeah, so Rob is going to jump in here and give you all a little antidote because- Am I? Yeah, you're next. Okay. Did you know that? Yeah, I don't I'm not next. I didn't know if I was gonna give an antidote. I think you are. A little bit. Go for a drop. Yeah, so scoot over, you're not, you're not able yeah. to. So I was, I was all with Sherry when she was doing, uh, Olivia with Sherry when she was doing a lot of this stuff in architecture school. So I sort of saw her immense frustration at, you know, she wants to learn how to build and the uh, classes that are supposed to teach her how to build are basically trying to destroy her brain. Um, and uh, and we meanwhile, of course, while that all is happening, she's reading this, so uh, <laughs> it, it hit home. Uh, all right, so what I want to take up on is, uh, uh, that so I, I wore uh, a plaid flannel shirt today in in honor of the hearty simple 
uh, frontiersmen who, who first stumbled upon the shores of what would someday be Detroit. Oh, dear. Uh, you did uh, not. Brits, I got Ritz on that one. Uh, <laughs> because he has this long tribute to these, to these men, who these, 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 these woodsmen, uh, and, and everything, all that they experience in the woods. He's, he's sort of, he goes on for a very, very long paragraph, waxing eloquent about that. Uh, but when he's talking about this dark column, he says, you know, the men who set foot on this spot where Detroit now stands beside the narrow strait, they saw these things, heard these things, lived these things, died these things, and many more. They thought not of Greek columns. They thought of the wilderness. They thought of hunger, of disease, of death, of foe upon foe, hardship after hardship, misery piled upon misery, con conquest rested after conquest. Heartily, they faced toil and danger. Struggle was theirs. Heroism was theirs. The solitude of the continent was theirs. The faith of the fanatic was theirs. Heroism and devotion and patience and fortitude were the stars in their night. The breaking dawn of whose century after, of whose second century of after narrative we are to celebrate in unblushing puerility. Wow. <laughs> Verily, they might say in their nameless graves, we ask not even for bread, but ye give us a stone. I think that's a biblical reference. Uh, so he's really, a, a huge part of this is, con, is con, a, a theme that he starts to get into here is contrasting the sort of hardy frontiersmen, the people who built America, the spirit of America with the spirit of the architecture that's being sort of foisted upon America. Where you know these guys go and 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 conquer an, an an unsettled continent, and then somebody comes along and says, "Well, I'll just plop a big dark column in the middle of there." And it's so imitative, it's so backward looking, it's so um, uh, secondhand, so 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 much so much that the people are it, it's architecture created by people who are not looking at reality and looking at the 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 real history of America and trying to come up with something that reflects that. So that's where he goes into this, and I want to talk a little bit about it. And I don't know that I have a good answer to it, but he bridges a crazy question to, here. It's coming up later too. Okay, I think it, this is something that's yeah. going to develop later. Very but much. He sort of indicates it a little bit here. The idea of uh, architecture in America should reflect American democracy. And democracy is the term he used. To the idea that it should reflect some sort of um, inherently American spirit. And let's see, there was a section here, was it on 64, on the wrong page, where he says, because yeah, we've had this whole discussion earlier about how behind the building that you see is the man you do not see. Mm -hmm. And now he's, he's sort of taking a broader social perspective on that. And he says, nothing more clearly reflects the status and tendencies of a people than the characters of its buildings. They are emanations of the people. They visualize for us the soul of our people. They are as an open book. And by this sign, the tendency today is, is disquieting. So this is the idea that, you know, we had behind the building you see is the man you do not see, the architect. Now he's saying, you know, if you take all the buildings as a whole, behind the buildings, there is the society that it's reflecting. Mm -hmm. And that we have an architecture that, you know, this, this sort of dark columns and, and this imitative architecture doesn't reflect the society uh, that uh, that has been built in America. And uh, and he talks a little bit about the uh, uh, the fact that we are really great, sorry, the, the fact that we are so, hold on, I'm sorry, I read this in a different format, so I'm trying to, the fact that we are so really great at potential democracy it is one which, stupendous though it be, seems to impress us chiefly in its aspect of geographical spread, physical force, and material national power, rather than its spiritual potency and glory as the liberating and vitalizing impulse of the soul of the people and of the individual man. So the idea of, of, of you know, it, I think it's all very vague here, so I don't have a whole lot to say about it, but he has, at this point, this sort of vague and coined idea that there's an American democracy, it should have a, a a, a different and specific spirit, the spirit of those, you know, frontiersmen and explorers who first uh, f uh, found where, you know, the area where Detroit would later be built, and that our architecture should reflect that specific spirit, 
The one thing I can say that is clearly coming through here is that the spirit of America should be one that is uh, liberating. And he talks about the, I think Sherry wrote, uh, read a quote where he talks about the medievalism mm -hmm. of the architecture schools. And so he's sort of contrasting the, the, the democratic versus the medieval. And it's the idea of the democratic as being liberating as uh, unleashing the power and creativity of the individual. Whereas the medievalizing version being that there's a set of authorities, there's a set of uh, existing books and traditions and everything's being copied out from there rather than something new and creative being, uh, 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 being brought into the world. And I think that's what he's really talking about when he talks about the architecture of democracy is you know here's this thing where we had this uh, uninhabited wilderness and we went out and we made farms and we made cities in this uninhabited wilderness. We created something out of nothing you know, individuals on their own creating something out of nothing. And we have an architecture that is just, instead of creating, instead of being creative and independent, is, <coughs> is imitative and uncreative. And that's his big complaint. Uh, so I don't have a whole lot more to add to that uh, because I think this is, he's establishing a theme here, but as is so often the case with Sullivan, he's establishing it in vague and sort of grandiloquent Quite way. Innocent. And then he'll come and, and he'll fill that in in a more specific way uh, later on. I also mm -hmm. found, you know, I talked last time about how I think that his style in these chapters is oftentimes he, in the, the sort of the Sullivan, the teacher voice, will come in and say things in a vague and grandiloquent way. And then the student voice will come in and restate them in a more down to earth or more specific and precise way. Well, my impression of these chapters is it's a lot of the vague grandiloquence from the teacher and the student has relatively little to say in these chapters. And I think that's, if we follow the pattern we have before, I, I expect that that's going to change and we're gonna get these things mm -hmm. defined a little better as we go forward. Mm -hmm. right. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Next up is Maritza. Um, so first I wanna say, even though I'm aware that this book is old and you guys have read it many times this week I almost felt like the words in in these chapters were written specifically to speak to me in today's time so I know that can't possibly be true but that's the way it felt and and there's a theme my week has a theme my, my there several different things I've been looking at and um reviewing have pointed to you know responsibility and um a couple other things mentioned here what spoke to me the loudest in these chapters. So, you know, he talks about, um, he does talk about imagination and, um, you know, and the chapters are imagination and then responsibility and attention. What spoke to me the loudest was this concept that we as individuals have become overly self-centered in our individualism. And as such, we've become stunted in our ability to be productive towards the community. And, you know, obviously I'm paraphrasing here, right? But that's, that's what I get out of the, the two chapters on responsibility. And they're, they're in the middle of the, the couple that we go through, but, um, He says a, a couple things that are just so impactful. And I'm going to start with so many people are half dead. Whoa, what? Okay, that's true. Tell me why. And it's like, he says that. And that's not the first thing you read, right? Because this is in the third chapter that I'm reading for this week. But that line just jumped out and like smacked me and 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 I felt like that said pay attention more than anything else I've been looking at yet right and he's urging us to step out of our indulgence of the self um he says today's individual has become self-centered and we drift along stretching ever further from societal concerns and what I, what I hear him saying to us is that it's an exponentially increasing problem because 
the the life of culture and what he says actually the, the phrase he uses is national life that's what he puts i'm extrapolating from that that what he he's calling national life is actually our country our culture and and he says that this national life so our culture is shaped and formed by all of the individual lives that are within that culture or country. And this is very near and dear to me because I, I have been ever increasingly convinced that you know, the answer to, or, or the path forward for us has to somehow lie in finding a balance of strength within the individual and strength within the community. It, it can't be an either or. And so this is why I feel like he was talking specifically addressing things I've said, like if, you know, the book has ears, right? And, you know, he says individual neglect, indifference or inattention thus become a collective neglect, indifference and inattention. And that's not a direct, you know, a quote, but this is, what I'm extrapolating from what he's saying and reading that statement there, that individual neglect, indifference or inattention. And this is what we're doing ourselves, right? And we're just plodding along, drifting. He's saying that as you do that, what you're actually doing is you're cultivating this systemic issue because it becomes a collective indifference and neglect. And then that, and then, when you hear that, in the back of my head, again, is that quote, so many people are half dead. And, and it makes you question. This is one of those moments for me where I had to stop and ask myself, am I one of those people? Am I half dead and I'm not aware of it? And, and I feel like all of us at some point, in full honesty, we have to answer yes, if we're living in this country because that's the culture that is promoted by this country. And it, if we do the self checks and move out of it, then it's not as big, it's not the systemic problem. But, you know, I, I, what I hear Sullivan saying is that we need to take a stock of ourselves internally to assess and determine whether or not we're cultivating the art of seeing and the art of listening. And, and that's, those are phrases he uses when he's telling us that we need to be attentive. And, and I see the chapter on, on attention as a call to self-awareness and to being awake and engaged in life. And this ties to me with the concept, I, in, in a previous, you know, in, uh, we're going through uh, Peterson in a different meetup here and um, this week's rule was, you know, to uh, notice that opportunity lurks where responsibility has been abdicated. And the fascinating thing about that is that we talked about a couple of different myths. And one of them was the Peter Pan um, story. And so Peter Pan is a, a, somebody who wants to remain a child and wants to hide from responsibility. And th the interesting thing here is that it's a different, it gives me a different take because Sullivan is saying to, to what I'm hearing him saying is that we actually need to have a little piece, a little bit of Peter Pan within us, but we have to be extremely careful that we're not Peter Pan. So Peter Pan should be a characteristic that forms some of our self, but it should not be us and hopefully this makes sense to you guys if not i apologize um the it's so and he goes on talking about and, and of course i'm doing this out of order because the first chapter is on imagination and he he speaks of imagination and and he ties it to being like the very soul of us but that made more that chapter made more sense to me after I had read the chapter on attention and the ones on responsibility. So to me, in my notes, I have it, the attention, uh, imagination after, because it made more sense to me. Like the, it tied in to me that um, imagination is the fuel 
that we're providing in order to avoid this half dead status for ourselves. And, and again, I hear this. So, so, you know, it's like the focus of these chapters, you know, he says, it's like attention responsibility. And he says, we need an individual awareness, social responsibility. And the, this concept of um, seeing is, and he says the art of seeing and the art of listening. And what I hear is that by taking responsibility, we can find our meaningful path, which is something that resonates with me. And it's something I'm hearing in different things that I'm, I'm looking at. And so, you know, that calls to me very strongly. Um, and, and he actually says we have a sickness of individualism. And I, I think that the imagination portion that he, he spells out for us is almost like an antidote because he says, let us remain children as we grow. He says, for I tell you, if you kill the child in man, you kill the man in man. And, and I, I think that the ability to maintain a sense of childlike wonder is key to allowing us increased responsibility. And I know that seems almost, you know, anathema. I don't know if that's an English word. I think it is. Um, oh, good. And so, so, but it seems that it's, it's contradictory, but it's not if you think about it, because if you don't have curiosity, and you don't have this innate like desire to seek, well then why would you bother to try to accept any responsibility? Why, why would you bother at all? And, and so this is a very kind of Maritza focus here, what I'm getting. I'm going to actually end here with a poem. Um, Emily Dickinson has a poem on the, on responsibility, right? And, um, you know, her poems don't actually have names, but if you put in bloom and you're looking for it, that's the, um, the poem. And so here you guys go. Bloom is result to meet a flower and casually glance would scarcely cause one to suspect the minor circumstance assisting in the bright affair so intricately done, then offered as a butterfly to the meridian to pack the bug, bud, oppose the worm, obtain its right of dew, adjust the heat, elude the wind, escape the prowling bee. Great nature not to disappoint, awaiting her that day. To be a flower is profound responsibility. Thank you, guys. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. It was beautiful. Uh, next up is uh, Joya. Well, I love that Marisa shared a poem. I think everybody knows that that my background when I, I come to this text is, is from a literature background. And so last time I talked a lot about poetry and next week I'm going to talk a whole lot about poetry, so, so to be forewarned. But today, I really want to talk about stories and to really think about the story that we're reading here. So Rob pointed out in one of our, our earlier talks that the genre of this work is a dialogue, like a Socratic dialogue. But one of the best parts about reading Plato's dialogues as a literature person is you start to read them also as stories, as almost mini plays. And the best dialogues are like that. They have characters that go on a journey that are going to change and transform due to what happens uh, through, throughout the dialogue. And here in, in the chapters that we have, I see a really important turning point. So we have the student character who is going to be going on a journey. And here in the middle in the attention chapter, it's signaled in this line. So at one point, the master teacher 
character uh, starts to worry. He says, uh, I fancy I have grown sophisticated with my generation and have lost the art of simple statement. And the student says, oh, don't let that worry you, pa. I'll fall into your pit one someday. And then soon after in the responsibility chapter, the teacher is gonna say, if now my son, we pause for a little. And so we see that we, we've really reached this turning point where there, there's been a change here in the relationship of these characters in the story that, that they've, they've grown closer, that they, they've gone from being just teacher and student to father and son. And so what has brought about that change? And I think to see that we have to go back to the chapter that we started with this week, which is the chapter about imagination. So in this chapter, Louis Sullivan, he, he's gonna describe imagination as the very soul itself. And I had a, a couple lines here I, I wanted to talk about. Uh, he has this wonderful quote where he says, the imagination of each person is that person. It is the key to his character. It determines what that person will receive and what that person will reject. And I just wanted to highlight that to tie it back to a discussion we had earlier where we were thinking about character and the importance of character. We, we had this idea that every building is going to show the character behind the person. And now we're learning that imagination is the key to character. So in this first chapter, Sullivan gives us a very analytical and kind of abstract description of imagination, but it's also a rather unimaginative <laughs> description of imagination. And I think he realizes that because then when we move on to the next chapter about the Doric column, we're going to get a more imaginative presentation. We're going to look at, he, we're going to find out what imagination is by starting to explore lack of imagination. And we're going to do it in a much more imaginative way. And how do we do that? We do it with a story. Literally, we have once upon a time, the people of the good city of Detroit conceived a plan to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the discovery of the site. So Louis Sullivan is going to tell us a story to, to, to make this point about what imagination is and the importance of imagination. And then in this chapter, we get this long description of the founders. And so Rob dressed up as the founders to, to maybe give us a glimpse of, of who this would be. But I think the real function of this, this long portion here really is to have a start to engage our imagination. So I definitely want, I'm not, and it is incredibly long. And so I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I think to, to really get into this text, you really have to spend some time here because this is where Louis Sullivan really is trying to demonstrate what imagination is by asking us to really use our imaginations. And there's a real way in which already the, the difficulties of the English language are, are, are part of the problem here because in English, we use the word imagination. It has the word image. It has the idea of picture. And so of course, as human beings, we are primarily visual creatures. That is perhaps our most important sense. It's certainly, I mean, we know now that the you know, most brain area you know, of all the senses goes to vision. But when we're really thinking about imagination, Louis Sullivan wants us to engage all of our senses, all five senses and our emotions. And he's gonna do that by giving us this long description of the experience of the founders of Detroit and what it was that they experienced in the wilderness. So I just wanna read this and, and encourage you all to try to activate all of your senses as you hear this. So Sullivan says, I will hazard or surmise that this particular architect never made his bed of bows in the somber gloom of the primeval forest, never saw the gleam of opalescent eyes across the waning firelight, never heard the curdling cry of the screech owl overhead, nor the distinct wolfish bark, now faint, now louder, always hungry, ever passionately mournful, now the low, sudden moan of the forest in the night's stillest, breathless hour, as an aged giant hemlock sank heavily to earth, nor saw the dawn break, pale and white, through the filmy branches, 
interlaced of pine and tamarack, and their stately brethren clustered upright and close in mute communion, nor heard the belch of a fired musket bellow and roar and roll along the edge of a slumbering woodland lake, now fainting around its capes and bays, now swelling aloud and dying again, reaching around and turning back in reverberation upon reverberation along the upright wall of woods and breaking and flying to and fro across the startled waters in a wild harangue of echoes, slowly blending, subsiding, and melting into the air and into the forest slowly away until after long and long stillness reigns again and solitude engulfing and resolving the strange harsh dissonance, nor climbed through the tangle and overfallen trunks, nor cushioned his foot on the mold of what was once a proud thing of the forest, nor smelled the faint sweet odor, oh so faint, so delicate, of the deep woods, standing in somber array, with trunks ever more serried, ever growing grayer and darker as they close and deepen in obscurity. And it still even goes on and continues. And it's significant that this is what finally captures the student's attention. So that when we start the next chapter, which is called attention, it starts with the student saying, do you know, I became so interested in your story of the forest that I forgot all about the blamed Doric column. It's his interest and his attention that's finally captured by this really sensual, emotional connection to the founders. And this is so important for the architectural lesson we have here, because what really is so bad about the Doric column? That it's secondhand, that it's imitative, and that it doesn't connect with the story of the founders. That we're, we're trying to create this monument to the founding of Detroit, but it's completely detached from that sensual, emotional experience, the story of what these founders did to create the great city. But when we can finally connect in with that, this is the breakthrough moment for the student when everything starts to change. And it's all about what captures his interest, his attention. And then we're going to learn here about the importance of attention. So in this chapter on attention, Louis Sullivan tells us, attention is the essence of our powers. And I want to stop and just make sure to draw all of your attention to this concept of powers. Because in my reading of Louis Sullivan, this is perhaps the most important concept that I think you have to get in order to get what Louis Sullivan is all about. So Gioti in, in one of our earlier sessions made the point that this book is really kind of spiritual literature. And I agree that, that Louis Sullivan is taking us on a spiritual journey. And what that journey is about is awakening our powers. That's his phrase, man's powers. We're gonna, we're gonna come to this and hopefully we're gonna also read uh, autobiography of an idea because that whole book is a story about powers, the, the child's dream of power and how it matures, is how I would describe what the whole of autobiography of, of an idea is about. So just to draw your attention, and, and hopefully we're going to keep coming back to this as we continue to explore Louis Sullivan, this important concept of powers. What are our human powers and, and how do we awake these powers? That's what this is going to be all about. And here we're going to get one of the most important first lessons, which is about attention and how attention, as he says here, is the essence of our powers. It is that which draws other things toward us. It is that which, if we have lived with it, brings the experiences of our lives ready to our hand. To pay attention is to live, and to live is to pay attention. And bear in mind, most of all, that your spiritual nature is but a higher faculty of seeing and listening, a finer, nobler way of paying attention. Thus must you learn to live in the fullest sense. And I think our other presenters really did a good job of trying to connect this then to the next chapters, which are all about responsibility and how responsibility is going to connect with attention but uh, this is really how, how we're 
building up and, and we're only just getting started because even as uh, he tells us here at, at the end of the last chapter we read here, thus does the responsibility for our buildings trace itself in part a step farther, but this is not the end of the story. And in fact, I would say the story is now just getting started. Wonderful, Joya. This is, this is fantastic. I think you're going to have a ball with the next section, which is going to be from professor to summer, uh, which is full of, full of poetry. So that's, and I think Maritza is also going to like it a lot. So uh, wonderful, thank you. Uh, next up is Rupali. Well, um, thank you, that was wonderful. I think everyone has done a phenomenal job of explaining all of uh, the, ideas in these chapters. So um, I'm just going to go back to the last week's uh, session where we talked about, you know, the student has arrived. So is arriving. And Louis Sullivan is talking about the student is arriving. And what that means is he's learning to observe. He's learning to reason. He's learning to think. And uh, in form follows function uh, chapter, the form follows function to um, he talks about the student um, who gets his first glimpse into imagination. And he says, imagination is beyond logic. He talks about uh, imagination being the subconscious energy. And although you need the faculties of observation, deduction, um, thought, all of that together uh, brings you to your own imagination. And imagination, according to him, is deeply rooted in reality. It's not outside reality. So the story that uh, Sherry talked about, the chicken bones, <laughs> the cardboard uh, chairs, they are not rooted in reality. And how can architects coming out of these colleges build something that is real? So. Uh, one of the things that uh, Sullivan talks about is uh, the, the power to receive and the power to give, right? And he says, unless you are able to receive, you cannot give. And the role of the architect is to give. The role of the educator is to give. Uh, I think whatever profession you are in, you are giving a service or offering something of value to somebody else, but you cannot offer anything if you are empty within you. And this whole training, you know, almost we are almost towards the midpoint of the book. And Louis Sullivan is just training this student to be able to receive, to awaken, as Joya said, awaken your senses, right? Learn to learn to take it all in. Um, to to give and to create, um, that requires, uh, and, and Louis Sullivan says this, it requires you to think much deeper than just what's on the surface. And uh, the Doric column is uh, just a fantastic example of how uh, that architect gives without really having anything deeper within. It's just a shallow, uh, plagiarist action of taking something from the past and, and think this is the tallest giant uh, column. But who needs the, the most, you know, the tallest column in the world? Because that's not the function of the Doric column. The Doric column, the Greeks used them. They, it was the simplest form of a column and it represented strength because it held the roof and it, it carried weight there was a purpose for its proportions and the simplicity of it just showed that this is the masculine strength of the building. So uh, when you put that as a memorial um, that has nothing to do with the spirit of the men that you're putting it for, it just doesn't mean anything uh, to society. So then comes the responsibility of the society. How can we tolerate all of this? How can we tolerate structures like this? Um, you know, as Sherry showed that chair, which was placed in terms of, uh, in, instead of the Doric column, people actually just broke it and misused it. Is that what we want our 
buildings and our architecture to be. So what is the responsibility of the, uh, of the public, of um, the society? Now, America is very unique. And coming from India, I can say that, you know, um, this country just offers a sense of freedom. Although India is a democracy, and I've said this before, the sense of freedom that you get in America, the individual freedom is huge. Now, the idea of democracy is quite old. We see that in ancient um, Greece, ancient India, uh, where people are governing themselves with uh, the consent of uh, their population. And then um, the Magna Carta is another important document that turns uh, is a turning point towards democracy. Um, the Declaration of Independence, talk about imagination, right? Did not exist before. The founding fathers created something completely out of their imagination. And I was looking up a map of uh, democracies in the world. And even in 2020, large parts of Asia and Africa are not democracies. And you can see when uh, Louis Sullivan wrote this book, there were even fewer democracies. It was only after World War II that um, more and more countries were democracies. They were uh, autocracies before that. And did people have individual freedom? Why is Louis Sullivan talking so passionately about freedom and democracy and individual thought, the value of individual thought? So it's really important to see you know, where we are in space and time, that even today, there are many people in the world that do not have the freedoms that we take for granted. And if we don't value that freedom, somebody is going to take that away from us. And so he is saying, as a society, we need to pay attention to that. Um, and he says, whose responsibility is it? It's you, it's me, it's us we are not above that. So that's um, the, the idea about responsibility of um, the public. And then when he goes into the responsibility of the architect, you know, he talks about um, inattentiveness. He starts the chapter with, you know, we, it would seem that inattention in that, in the many implies either that the faculties of the individual have not been aroused and trained or that a lethargy has supervened. So if individuals don't pay attention, um, then they don't hold themselves accountable. And I see this um, not only with architects, but also with educators that, um, you know, they, um, they don't hold themselves accountable and they justify anything and everything um, you know, for example, in Montessori, we have a famous, so like form follows function, Montessori uh, has the, uh, she coined the phrase, follow the child. And so under the guise of follow the child, the many educators will just let the child fall off the cliff. But that's not the point of follow the chi child. What is the child's nature? And where are you guiding them? Similarly, what is the nature of architecture? And he begins to give a glimpse of um, what good education should look like and what failed education looks like. And um, I think Sherry did a very good job of saying, you know, uh, who, so uh, who cares? The social co consequences are not obvious. It's nobody's business but ours. So, so it really is important as parents, as educators, as architects, as um, individuals, as citizens that we pay attention. So how are attention, discipline, imagination, how are they all related? What is the value of democracy? What is um, the value of freedom and responsibility? Why is it important as a student of architecture? And so in the next chapters, he's going to explain more. I, I, I almost wanted to talk about the professor too, because in the Montessori, um, in the Montessori education, Maria Montessori talks about the prepared environment and the prepared teacher. 
the prepared environment for me, I would say, if you consider your nation as the prepared environment, what freedoms and what choices can individuals make um, for us to survive, for us to prosper as human beings? Freedom is so important and with freedom comes responsibility. You cannot just enjoy freedom. We um, have this ongoing conversation in our upper elementary and middle school classrooms because the sense of justice is very uh, accentuated in that age group between the ages of nine to 13 and everything is unfair and everybody is doing things that are not right. Um, and only the child is right, but the adults know nothing. So uh, that's where we talk about, you know, we have the class constitution and I've talked about it in the past, but then the teachers have freedom cards and responsibility cards and they're back to back. So on one side, the freedom is to choose your own work. The responsibility is that you can do it without disturbing others and interrupting others. The freedom is that you can leave the classroom and go to any other room in the school the responsibility is that you inform somebody where you are in case of a fire drill or whatever safety. So once the children know the freedom and the responsibility, they go hand in hand. It's not that you can have freedom without any responsibility. So I'm going to share my screen to just show some um, ideas about Montessori and imagination. So. Um, both Maria Montessori and um, Louis Sullivan talk about the true basis of imagination being reality. And to allow children, allow, and, and when we're talking about this uh, architect who has never made a bed of boughs and in the wilderness, has never seen an animal, uh, you know, or, or, or heard the owl screech. Well, if you just go to school and learn from the books and learn only what's in the past, then you are taking yourself away from the reality. But for, to allow children um, to, to be part of um, nature, to let them observe nature, and this child is just drawing the trunk of this grand old oak tree uh, that's in our schoolyard. And last week, uh, Sherry talked about the oak tree and how solid the base of the oak tree is to support the large mass it has uh, above. So by making these observations, children automatically start uh, forming connections in their mind. Now, every year students study uh, different um, continents, they study animals, they study birds, and they really do a thorough research of the biomes, of the life cycle, of the parts of a tree, the parts of the animals. And that education is important because without knowing what our world is made up of, what the details are, you cannot take that leap into imagination. And so Louis Sullivan in his chapter of a on attention says, well, pay attention to those details. And so does Maria Montessori. And um, so that's uh, on attention. And here is a group of children just fascinated by this little spider spinning a web. And you can see the excitement and the delight in their eyes, in their expressions. Um, no one's going to have to tell them how a spider uh, makes its web. You know, they can they can figure it out, and we can see that uh, when so these children were in kindergarten when this picture was taken, and now they are in fourth grade. And when I see their drawings, I can see how intricate when they make origami structures, how intricate they are because they've spent time observing and thinking. And you cannot teach this. This has to happen internally. Those connections have to happen internally. So what Maria Montessori talks about is let the children take their time to understand. Don't rush the children. There's no rush. Let them take the time to, uh, to absorb. 
And here we have, uh, we were hatching chicks in the classroom, chickens. So there you can see a newborn, um, just an egg hatched. And the whole class for 45 minutes just stood still. There was pin drop silence because nobody wanted to disturb this little chick that was trying to hatch. The teachers did not ask the children to be quiet. It was just nature, you know, you can be, captured by nature and to see a chick, oh, can we help the chick? Can we crack the egg for it? No, it has to do its own work. Nature has to do its own work. And so the child has to do his own work. The architecture student in the architecture has to do their own work of observing, of assimilating, of making those connections. And you do that by by experiencing life to the fullest. That's what Louis Sullivan talks about too. And on the side, you you know, a day in spring, there are earthworms and it doesn't matter how young or old the children are, those earthworms are always very fascinating and they try to save every single one of those. So how do children get there? And here you see a child doing a typical Montessori work, doing uh, learning about geometric solids. These are the building blocks of construction of structures. And here the child can really observe and say, how many surfaces does the solid have? What are the physical characteristics? Uh, how can, how many diagonals, how many uh, vertices? How, how is one shape related to another? What are the curved shapes? What are the rectangular shapes? And so by making those observations, children are learning to pay attention to detail and those become impressions. You know, I have a Montessori student who's now in college and uh, he, she, he was just explaining that when he had his uh, math paper and he had to figure out a problem, he just closed his eyes and felt the Montessori beads and the materials uh, and was able to come up with a solution because it was not a problem that he had worked on before, but he had to figure it out during the exam. So it's not just regurgitating facts, but making those connections and seeing how do they work. Learning about different cultures, learning about different languages. You know, you're training your mind in a different manner when you uh, pay attention to details of things that are not familiar to you. And so as a result, what happens is you can start constructing things from your imagination, whether it is art, literature, poem, we have students. Um, we're going to be talking about poetry soon and every year we have poetry recital. We start with poems in the classroom by just reciting poems and studying poems. And then children start writing and composing their own poems and they're profound because they've read good literature. So from, from reality to imagination, students can take their ideas and create something new and meaningful. So here on the left, you have um, the student, uh, he was probably in first or second grade at that time. He studied Asian countries and uh, studied a particular uh, cat from an Asian country. So he did his research using his books, um, you know, uh, and then he drew a picture of that. And then from his imagination, he was able to create a robot that would mimic the, uh, the movement of that cat. And so again, there's no other person in the world who has a cat like that because it's from his own imagination. And it is, you know, imagine, Imagination doesn't mean that it has to be crazy or unreal. It is, it is rooted in reality. And here you can see these uh, students just fascinated by the uh, motor, you know, allowing the fan to take off and just that excitement now will help them make uh, connections. So, um, so what, um, what Louis Sullivan is saying to us is that, you know, learn to observe, learn to look at things. And then from there, you can develop your imagination. It doesn't have to be imitative. It doesn't have to be 
very fancy. It just has to, it, it doesn't have to be very logical in that sense. It can be something creative, something different from what you uh, are. And it can reflect the society that we live in because he says architecture is nothing but a reflection of society, the people who live in that society. That's my take. Wow, Rupali, that was that was fantastic. These are incredible presentations. Okay, so um, Sherry gave us a short tour of the insane asylum, which is the schools, and the uh, the the um, and they are trying to build something in a certain way. Um, Rob talked about the architecture reflecting a people. Okay, and Rupali at the same, I want to jump to Rupali here. Rupali is talking about actually taking in reality of things, you know, and taking in life so that you can let the life flow through you. So it is partly you only, you have to actually pay attention to the people. You have to actually pay attention to, to reality, to life, take all of that in and only with that you can build. Um, the other part, and this is again, you know, we're going to be talking about Marshall McLuhan soon. His idea is that man shapes his tools and then the tools shape man. Mm -hmm. That is profoundly true. Yeah. It's only if you take things, if you take life in and build tools based on that, then those tools actually will help you live, live better. If you do other things, like if you use chicken bones, okay, that's not, you're not taking in life. And what you're building is actually going to impair life at all levels. So there is, there is that loop of taking in reality and expressing and what it makes possible. So it's, this is just incredible. Um, Marisa's presentations are just like first discovery of are uh, these Louis Sullivan's ideas and the complexity of it. So it's just wonderful to have her describing the experience. There is this firsthand, almost this, I see the same kind of thing in, you know, Mar Marisa's presentation that I saw in Rupali's picture of those kids looking at the spider. Okay, so that's what Marita does. You know, she looks at the spider of what, what's, what, what Louis Sullivan is up to, you know? Uh, and he's he's weaving a web, you know. Uh, so, and uh, Joya brought in the uh, the the point about the story. You know, the story is a, is like the integration of who a person is and where they are going. And uh, that was that was just wonderful. So thank you. Um, so folks, now we're going to do some questions. So if you have, it's about four o'clock. So we've got about forty five minutes for questions. So go ahead and type in an exclamation mark if you would like to uh, ask questions. Uh, again, the same rules, type exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom in order to speak, keep on topic, be brief, uh, feel free to disagree courteously. Uh, at this point, because we are short of time, focus on questions uh, more. And you can make comments, but keep the comments uh, short. So go ahead, uh, we'll start with Joe. Joe. Um, yeah, I just want to second really quickly how amazing the presentation actually of all, every, all the panelists really was. It really brought together an understanding of the whole. And I saw that in Maria Montessori's uh, quote there uh, for a moment where you talked about imagination, freedom, responsibility, and the art of storytelling and how that all integrates into something. It's like a real systems thinking. But I really am curious as to what is driving the type of schooling that architects are going, getting now that Sherry discussed? Because I, you, know, the, you laid out so beautifully what an ideal learning system looks like and how we could actually experience and come up with design and our own ideas. What are some of the things that are actually, I, I mean, the chicken thing, I'm still trying to get in, out of my I head. And I mean, I, that almost seems like it would be traumatizing to a certain degree. It's almost traumatizing to me here. And what is driving that type of education versus the education that we've actually discussed here uh, this afternoon? 
Mm, that's a big, big topic. Um, honestly, and, and Srikant will jump in here if this is, it's such a big topic that I'm going to put it in one way. I think there is a sense of life need for some people to stamp out instead of inspire. And so if they see um, a spirit, if they know, if they themselves have given up that spirit, the spirit that Sullivan's talking about, if they themselves have given them that up and then Sullivan at this time sees so many people, he calls them, I am tired of man shadows. I detest these schools as they are now conducted because they make shadow men. They make that because the teachers are looking to squish out that spirit in people. Um, and that's where it's a culture wide thing too, because in the culture at a whole, they're looking to squish out that spirit. And I'll tell you this now, the only way I got out, when I, I never was at risk, but um, in order to get the degree, I had to, I had to hide some of my own expression. And I had to find a way to literally sneak out the back door to get my degree to not have to put all of that time essentially in the trash can and then go to yet, okay, yet a third school. <laughs> so in order to get my degree. So I think it really is because as a culture, there is a sad, sad state of the majority of people have given up that spirit, that childlike spirit and they don't want to see it because if they see that in others, that's a reminder that they've given it up in themselves. And so it's almost a self-preservation for them to stamp it out wherever they see it. Uh, Rob, do you have anything? Would you like to add anything to this? What, the question, uh, Joe's question was that, how come this crazy stuff is going on in these universities? What's, what's, what's behind this? Um, uh, Joe, have something to add? Just really quickly, yeah. I mean, what's driving this degree of conformity? Is it like, it's almost as if that society can't handle all the creativity that you guys have just talked about. That's that's kind of where I'm seeing this balance: is conformity and creativity, and that there's this forced conformity that that's coming along with school and being driven up, driven by uh, current uh, schooling structures. Well, I, the one thing I can add to that, uh, I didn't hear everything Sherry said, but the one thing I can add to that is that I, I was struck by the, the section in here in, in Sullivan about the lack of accountability. Mm. You know, so he says, you know, if, if, if physically, if, you know, if you, uh, if, if you're given the care, care of a child and he comes mm. back physically deformed or, or, mm -hmm. or mistreated or, or maimed in some way, there'd be, you know, it, it's very easy to see. So it would be obvious, oh my God, how, how could you be possibly allowed to, to be in charge of children? Whereas they come back mentally uh, and educationally warped, it's harder to see and harder to judge so people can't, can't see that. And, it, and the universities in particular have become this sort of closed loop. <laughs> and it has partly to do with the economics of it that, uh, and with the way the universities are run, you know, every organization has a tendency to ultimately be run for the benefit of the, of the administrators, right? <laughs> and they, they want to come, and to the extent that it's economically possible, they want to create this sort of closed loop for themselves where uh, everything's run around us and our concerns, and uh, we have no accountability to anybody on the outside. And you know, that's why every, every big corporation, you know, ultimately has to have, there, there, there's some of the, a, ten, a, a trend that happened in the 80s called the shareholder rebellion, where there was this nice sense that, you know, you had all these big managers of the big corporations who were running everything for their, you know, 
for the benefit of themselves and for their own incentives and not paying attention to increasing the value for the shareholders. And so you had these you know, hostile takeovers and, and things like that, where you had to kick out the existing management and reassert that, no, you're working for the shareholders. Well, that's not done in the universities. And the universities, and I think it has to do fundamentally with the model, Srikant will talk about this, this talk, and I, we've talked with Srikant about this before, <laughs> that you have the model of the universities comes, first of all, it comes out of the monasteries and is deeply influenced by the Platonic idea of this sort of ivory tower, right? Where uh, it's pure contemplation for its own sake. And the ideas don't have any contact with reality. And it's, you know, and, and the ideal is everybody else owes it to the philosopher kings to send them money and power and build up these ivory towers for them so they can engage in pure contemplation in this, in this closed loop. And that's, I think, that fundamentally you go all the way back to Plato that you get that sense of what it what a university and what an intellectual enterprise is supposed to be like and it is this closed loop with no connection to the outside world and so but that gets built then into the economics of the modern university especially the uh to some extent the publicly funded universities where you know uh, or the, the the student loans coming in that all there's all this flow of money into the universities that has nothing to do with the actual value they're creating educationally and with the actual skills that they're imparting to the students. And so the, the, the whole educational system has gotten too closed off and too unaccountable in terms of what it's actually producing as, a, as, as the results in the child. Yes, all kinds of weird things grow in static water. <laughs> uh, next up is going to be Anne, Michael, Jyoti, Rohit, and Ash. Anne, go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you. And I, I agree with everyone else. The presentations were excellent. However, I, you know, I kind of get the chicken example. I, and I get it as a, I don't, I don't espouse this, but I kind of get it. And I can see how it actually arose out of this Sullivan euphoria over imagination. Um, there, it, I would, in that aspect, I would see it at, from that perspective, I would see it as uh, the instructor trying to promote in the students this imagination uh, with regard to the stakeholders in an architectural project. Um, the chicken being the surrogate stakeholder in the chicken example. And similarly, uh, with the whole, um, you know, draw something that's, that's twisted and then somehow through all those iterations, turn it into a chair. So it, it's to me, these instructors, you know, trying to um, misguidedly uh, create imagination in their, let's face it, young adult students these aren't Montessori children and it's kind of like does that belong in the curriculum but you know it was Sullivan himself that went off on this rap rap rhapsodic uh, elegy as Joya um, so beautifully enunciated for us and it's, it's kind of like at some point the question is didn't Sullivan really generate what we now see as the slippery slope of outcome. Go ahead, who would like to respond? So the key word was misguided over there. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, and um, the thing is that uh, as an educator, as an architect, um, you know, the thing is that when educators themselves don't have the imagination, they create something like imagination, something that they perceive to be imagination, something that could be crazy, which really doesn't have a purpose. And architects have a purpose. They have to build structures that are going to last. And so when we teach that imagination could be just anything and that it has no value, that it could mean one thing to you, one thing to somebody else, uh, which even Louis Sullivan says that. He says, my imagination is my from my mind, yours is from yours. And unless you've experienced certain kind of experiences, you're not going to be able to imagine what I imagine. And so um, 
when you give insufficient materials or insufficient tools and you demand students to make something out of it, you're actually causing them frustration and a feeling that I'm no good. That's not the goal of education. The goal of education is to say, okay, here is something as human beings we have created and where are we going to take the next step? How are we going to get to the next thing? Or where is, you know, what do you want to create that's something unique or different? And uh, chicken bones could be one material, but those are not tools for architects to build. And I just feel that, you know, I have seen as an architect myself when I did my master's thesis um, in, uh, not my master's, my bachelor's thesis in ferro cement. Um, my professors could not imagine a staircase that was one inch thick. They could not imagine it. And it existed for over uh, 50, 60 years before I did my thesis on it. And because they couldn't imagine it, they told me that I couldn't uh, graduate from architecture school. And the, the engineer I had to, I was working with, invited them for breakfast. This is very typical in India. You call somebody for food, you give them a cup of tea, and then he walked them through the building and showed the one inch um, staircase. And then I was allowed to, <laughs> to uh, submit my, my project. But the problem is educators don't have the imagination that Louis Sullivan is saying. And Joe, to your question too, why, why are these schools or colleges not able to break away from the past is because people are not spending enough time to think and, and be the potential or reach their own potential to, to create something new. Um, I wanna add one thing, you know, we looked at uh, Thomas Aquinas view of integration of senses. So what happens is that there is a hierarchy to human faculties. And that's a very big point for Sullivan too. You have to take in a lot and imagination sits on the top of that. And it's a immensely powerful faculty when it is sitting on the top of a lot of input from reality and from memory. When you have that rich base, and only if you have that rich base, imagination can produce wondrous things. When you don't have that, and you try to exercise the faculty without it, you produce things that are actually harmful. So there is a hierarchy and kind of proper proportion of that. And training is all about building those layers and layers. And imagination sits on the top of that. So it's um, so this is an example of inverted hierarchy. Another thing I would say is that the examples that Sherry talked about, um, they are of a very, in some ways, they are of a different kind than Sullivan, but there is a commonality. Most of the things that Sullivan was faced with, we're talking about the 19th century, is that people were worshiping forms of the past. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a worship of each people's emotion, no matter where it came from. So there is a subjectivist. And whereas there, it was like a traditionalist worship. And here it is a subjectivist. Worship. Neither of them is about reality. And so there are like two different forms of going wrong. Uh, Sherry, would you like to add anything? Sherry, you're up. I would like to add a couple of things. So I can talk about Sherry's experiences as an observer watching it. So <laughs> one thing I want to say is that I do think there's a value to certain sort of creativity exercises where you create some artificial or arbitrary situation limitation. And you say, okay, you know, like we've seen there, there's people do these contest shows where they hey, say, okay, there's a fashion show was that one of these, I can't remember what it's called, uh, by Project Runway or something like that, where they did this show of like, okay, here are these odd, unusual materials and you have to make clothing out of this. And, mm. you know, and you got some extremely creative results on us. If somebody, if you have a, a range of things you could choose from that are not traditional clothing materials, but you take them and you rework them and you're able to create something. And some people did some very creative things. So there can be a value in these exercises where you say, I'm going to create this sort of arbitrary set of conditions that are out that are very unusual and then you know you have to exercise your creativity to then come up with a way to do something 
I've seen that in Sherry's project sometimes where there'll be something goes wrong or there's, she gets, you know, you get something back from the engineer saying, well, no, you can't build this the way you thought you'd be able to build this because of the structure. So you have to redesign something a second or third time. And sometimes you get a better result, you know, having redesigned it, uh, uh, you know, like the second or third thing that's mm -hmm. redesigned and someone, because of some unexpected condition ends up being actually a more creative and better solution than the original one. But what I observed when she was in school was that that wasn't the spirit behind no, these exercises. Not at all. This, and I think the crucial thing, and the one she gave about how you know, you had to build this thing and the then, box, and then the box, you know, the, and then they put the thing inside of the box, is that there was no connection. That everything was always reset completely from one to the mm -hmm. next. There was no way to build anything up, and it was really about conditioning you to think everything's arbitrary and irrational. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that I found is that it wasn't, no, sure I was saying it used to be, it was about conformity with the old styles and now it's about subjectivity. This wasn't about subjectivity. This was really about conformity with the new approach and the whole spirit of it. And this is a long thing going back in education. The spirit is, question is whether the role of education is to build up the powers or the faculties as, as, as uh, Sullivan's Sullivan talking about. To build up the powers of the student or to break them down. And there's an approach to education here that is like architecture school, the studio classes. The purpose of it was to break down your brain, mm -hmm. break down your ability to think. And then it would be so empty that you would basically, whatever the, whatever the teachers want to pour into it, whatever the current fad or fashion is, that's what they would pour into it. And that's what you'd end up doing. And that's exactly what they were after. I mean, because you you would, you, when you'd question, you would get a consistent message back and they were literally trying to break everybody and they did almost everybody. Excellent. Uh, next questions are from Michael, Jyoti, Rohit and Ash. Michael, so let, let, let's just look at the time here. We got 4.14, so we got about 30 minutes. Um, Michael. Yes. Uh... Hi everyone, uh, this is great. Thank you for your, each for your shares. Um, so the word groundedness was coming to mind throughout the discussion. And I was just wondering, as it relates to Louis Sullivan's life, um, he seemed like an extremely imaginative person full of ideas. And I'm just wondering, in his reflections, did he express, um, did he write about times in his life where he felt like his imagination got the best of him? Not necessarily, I don't know if he would, he actually shared that he was shirking responsibilities and felt that he was just giving life and energy to all of his ideas. And as a result, uh, the responsibilities were kind of not being honored. But what do you, do? does anyone here know of any of his reflections on that, if there were any, and how he got himself back uh, to being more responsible? Uh, anybody wants to take that? Um, what I would recommend, Michael, is to read autobiography of an idea uh, because the way he functions is actually very different from modern day people. And so this is one thing I like about reading people from the past because the way, like the ground of where they're coming from is so different. So for example, today we are living in a subjectivist- After one of my books- Subjectivist view. Uh, you know, in, in a subjectivist world. So what happens is that it's very common to say, okay, I had a certain feeling and it turned out to be wrong. That's actually a very common experience for people. Like people like Sullivan, they build what they have, the kind of, the kind of feelings that they have are actually built on something very, very large, built over a very, very long time. So they have a very, it's a very different character. So this kind of issue will not probably occur to him. He would say, yes, I will make mistakes. And of course, mistakes are natural and I will correct them. And that's just how things are. Uh, but those things, when the kind of the questioning at the level that you're talking about, um, I think it's much more common when the base is kind of more subjective as opposed to this tremendous reverence for reality and life as a starting point. Um, next up is going to be Jyoti, Rohit, and Ash. 
Jyoti. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm going to come down to the brass tags. In the modern life with this technology, such advanced uh, technology and social media and overrated politics and what have you, how can we invoke in people powers and primitive forces so they could be brought closer to nature to wash away all the to toxic coatings? That is my question. Mm -hmm. Part of um, it, I, I think Shrikant did respond to Mike. So I got that little piece in a diff indirect way. But it's but a fantastic anyway. question, Jyoti. Yeah. Excellent question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we tend to take the computers away <laughs> <laughs> and push them outside into the woods. We make the, you know, we make our kids do physical work for the, you know, chopping down trees, things like that. They, they, they learn the value of things other than social media when they don't have social media and then they wait a minute you just spent a week with interns you should be an expert on yeah this well um and every now and then they thought they would uh be worried about their selfies yeah. um <laughs> <laughs> but mostly they were worried about doing stuff and we um yeah rob was just mentioning that the past week here i've had two interns 14 year old girls um who have taken a week of their schooling to find out um, what it's like to be an architect. So I brought them along literally every minute of my day and put them to work. Um, so they got to see every aspect of what I do. Um, it's, it's, they, they did use their computers for, you know, documenting everything, but yeah, you got to unplug them from everything because it's, um, and I saw that with, um, with them a little bit, there is a, there is a, a, a sense that so that social media is um, is a real group of people. I mean, yeah, technically <laughs> there are people on the other end of it, but it's not that really the same as real people, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, unplug people. Yeah, I, I also think that social media can be overestimated as a factor. I think that uh, if you actually looked at the statistics, there's like. Um, a small group of people who are extremely online, uh, but it actually is a, it's still extremely online is the term they use. And meaning that they're on Twitter all the time. They're on Facebook all the time. They're on their computers all the time and, and totally absorbed in this. And it becomes their alternate, it becomes their reality, their, their world, their so whole social context becomes this artificial environment. Um, and then there's some people who are in meetups uh, for hours and hours at a time. <laughs> <laughs> but these are real people I, I we can actually see their faces this is yes. just an artificial interface but, but they're real people <laughs> what i'm saying is though that the, the extremely online people who live in who live and breathe social media all the time are a very small minority uh and the interesting thing is though i think they you get a lot of pieces of articles written about it because among that small minority are people who are in the media uh, because for various reasons, we have mm -hmm. to be online all the time. So we, we sort of obsess over, are we online? Are we online too much? And the answer is yes, you probably are, but <laughs> it doesn't mean that the rest of the population is, uh, uh but oh. so I, I, I do think that engaging people with real and interesting things to do is, is, and that there's so much value in it and so much reward to it. So that's all I'll say. So I'll add to this in, in the chapter on attention. Louis Sullivan says, well, the students say, say, why don't you tell me how to get near that loop? And Louis Sullivan, the, the teacher says, I was intending to take you for an outing in the country, but I shall have to postpone it now until you quiet down. <laughs> and I wrote in the margins, what does it mean to quiet down? <laughs> you know, there's so much noise around us and we can easily get distracted by that. And he then says, he, the student says, oh, come, let's go to the country. And uh, the teacher says, no, discipline is part of my program. You must stick to your lessons until they begin to stick to you. Mm -hmm. And so I think he captures that really well in that, that once we slow down, once we learn to observe and do the work, and then in Maria Montessori's uh, books, she talks about uh, the middle school years, the 
uh, elementary years as the years of plenty where children have the strength. And what Sherry talked about an internship program at our school, all middle school students um, have to do a, a project, a year long project that they then teach to other students. So you saw the student teaching um, Japanese uh, writing, calligraphy. Uh, we have another student who he is a dancer and he teaches our students, the rest of the students in after school to, to dance. So teaching children to be productive, to be engaged in real work is the key. And um, I think for adults to, to, to do things meaningfully and to add value. So I, I would like to add one thing. Uh, I think the key word that uh, Sherry said was unplugging. See, what happens is that it's not just social media, it's television too. What has happened is that the thing that is different from Sullivan to people that you see today is kind of the television. Basically, people consume like three hours of television a day. Social media is like weaponized television. Okay? Yeah. The, the thing that differentiates it is that it is a, it is a reactive medium. You're just reacting to things going on. And there is an incentive for whoever is putting things out to make things more, more emotionally impactful. So you're basically caught in a reactive loop of feeling things that are being generated by other people's imagination not rooted in reality. And that's what you're feeding into your brain all the time. And that's what is that's what is terrible about it. So simply unplugging, just the simple solution is to minus, you know, subtract. So if you subtract that, okay, this, there will be space for you to connect. And with all due respect, Rob, I disagree. The thing that is different about this is that here we read books, okay? Secondly, you are not watching this as TV. You're interactive, yeah. okay? So you're asking questions. You, I insist that you keep written notes. Writing is, so reading is one thing, which is very different, which is more active. Watching and writing and keeping notes is very active. See, there is writing there. <laughs> and talking back. And so what it does is that it is a, it is a process of more interactive. So essentially it is active versus reactive. That is the difference. The thing that is wrong with most people is that they are too reactive and they're using media, using mediums, which make that more so. Excellent. Uh, next up is going to be Rohit followed by Ash. Rohit. I just have a, maybe a quick question. When he uses the word democracy, what does he actually mean? Mm. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll jump in and say that he, we're, we're gonna get more he's going to go into it in much more detail so so part of this is a, a kind of a stay tuned for yeah, let us, yeah. let, let, but, that's, but that's i'll just say really quickly he he contrasts democracy to feudalism so i think rob was even already kind of getting to that with this idea of medievalism medievalism so if you think of sort of the opposite of feudalism the democracy and freedom is what he's talking about but stay tuned so sure. i also want to mention though that the the sort of philosophical confusion i sometimes see in, in sullivan does come through here there's one section where he talks about the the altruistic idea of the uh, oh, right to the pursuit of happiness. I'm like, um, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, here it is. The altruistic conception of a fundamental right to the pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of happiness and altruism are opposites. They are contradictions. Um, and that's especially, you know, he's writing, I think, a little less than 50 years after the term altruism was originally coined. And it was coined to refer to a, a radically collectivist uh, viewpoint in which individual happiness is spe very specific. Auguste Comte was the guy who, who uh, French philosopher, who coined the term altruism. It didn't, wasn't in use before that. And he literally meant it as the idea that the individual has no right to his individual happiness, that your only purpose of life is to uh, uh, vive pour altrui, to live for others is your okay. only purpose in life. You have no right to your individual happiness. So again, you know, so if you go to the philosophical roots of altruism, it's it, it, this conception. It is the exact opposite of the individual right to the pursuit of happiness. So there's clearly some little bits of philosophical confusion coming up here in the way Sullivan uses that. So I think that's all I have. I have not read this book before, so I'm not sure what's going to happen. In the You've read part. 
I it definitely have, comes in. It'll, yeah, I, I'm, and he has written a whole book called Democracy, A Man's Search. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Rohit, answering your question yeah. briefly, is that uh, the democracy, I mean, it's an unfortunate user word. I mean, it means completely different to him than what it means um, to us. Um, so to tell you, to point to what he's talking about, uh, I can describe it in terms of analogy. What he's saying is that there are two conceptions of human being. One is a human being um, who is like, who owns his own self, Mm -hmm. and who is trying to do things or you th so there are two the second view is that of feudalism that an individual is just a part of a larger system and individual doesn't matter what he's so there is there are two views either right. as an independent being individual as an independent being or individual as basically a slave right. those are the two views of him he th he calls the social system based on slavery as feudalism. Mm -hmm. His name for the kind of social system where an individual is regarded as an individual being, uh, independent being, is democracy. That's what okay. he calls democracy. Got it. Got it. So if you want to map that idea into something that we know, it would be the original idea of America. It would be the you know, American Republic. It's basically the structure that makes possible independent existence. Uh, you know, in independence of individuals, which is what he's passionate about. And, and his ability to kind of formulate that is nowhere near as good as the founding fathers, his kind of understanding of what it makes. But he has incredible number of insights about how both of these systems function and what happens to individual beings within these two. But the democracy is his name for what he's referring to as a system appropriate for independent individual beings. Okay, got it. Last question is from Ash. Yeah, thank you all again for another interesting discussion. Um, so Joya brought up this point uh, of Sullivan's about the power of, of attention. And I thought that was really interesting. It's a very powerful, essentialized uh, sort of statement. Um, and, you know, and it relates to a lot of the other things you've been talking about, about, um, you know, how so much of our attention is taken up in these sort of reactive media that as, as Maritza mentioned, it, uh, our power kind of encourages us to live in this sort of reactive, almost half dead state of existence. Um, but to add another, layer of complexity to, to it. Um, I, I just was wondering about this related, potentially related concept of intention and how you think that relates to Sullivan's concept of attention or, um, or if he has anything to say about that, like does, is, is attention sort of a prerequisite or precursor of intention or does, does, uh, attention follow intention as form follows function or does it sort of fit in this hierarchy of human faculties that Sri Khan mentioned somewhere between attention and imagination uh, just wondering if you have any thoughts on that I have some thoughts about that there was a, a passage actually that I had marked that I, I didn't read but I want to read so it, it ties in with this so at one point he says here uh, so what I call attention becomes what you call interest so what you call an impression becomes what I call an answer so living becomes action seeing and listening functions of life and all by virtue of the gentle force we call sympathy sympathy the receiver the giver sympathy i you the poet and in the responsibility chapter he's even going to identify that inattention not indifference is the root of the trouble so i see him using attention in this this broad sense that that captures i think both observation and values then I think what you're calling intention. Right. Um, so any closing thoughts from the panelists? I have something to add. Um, you know, the uh, thing about Louis Sullivan's writing is packed with metaphors and those metaphors are packed with so much meaning. I uh, want to read this one passage he talks about um, 
architecture in terms of chemistry. And so I'll, I'll just read that. Let us therefore place the art on an intelligible basis. Let us test it and reveal it, uh, reveal it for gold or dross by the sure touchstone of healthful human nature. Let us, let us test it by the solvent of reason, by the crucible of common sense, by the sure test of the spirit of democracy. Let us ignore the books, the schools, and go forth into the broad open world where the real things are. Let us there study the living organism, the real thing in health and illness. Let us do this with minds wide open. And I think, you know, all of those words related to chemistry really say, study it, find out what is um, the key and then, you know, just do things and not sit behind books. That's, if I, if I can, I, I, I think there's another little passage that just ties perfectly to Rupali's. Uh, he says, to pay attention is to live. And to live is to pay attention. And bear in mind, most of all, that your spiritual nature is but a higher faculty of seeing and listening, a finer, nobler way of paying attention. Thus must you learn to live in the fullest sense. And I feel like he's saying the same thing, just in a slightly different way there. And and I think I'm going to um, jump off of this new little wave we've got going <laughs> <laughs> and read one of the passages that I couldn't fit in either. So <laughs> this one um, is in the chapter uh, attention as well. Um, but when you accumulate, accumulate abundantly, absorb totalities, not fragments. Grasp the largeness of things, not the petty isolated aspects. Lay hold upon the warm significance of realities, not the mere cold currency passing from hand to hand. Seize upon the drift, the color, the intensity, the what you may call it of the moving teeming life about you, not merely upon its broken facts of definition and follow, follow, Follow every path, every trail that leads you towards emotional and spiritual riches, paths hidden alike to the heedless and the oversure. And then when you give, give of your abundance. And this it is to live. Wait, wait, then can, I want to jump in and just read this next part that comes right after. <laughs> this is literally right after what Sherry said, but it's so important, yeah. especially what, what we talked about, about what Srikant said about the base that we're building on. And here he's going to talk about it in terms of what you receive, so everything you receive. And here he says, if you receive not, you cannot give. And to receive of life, you must be awake to it. Shut the heart and you close the open door of sympathy upon yourself. And in the doing, the light of the world. It is sympathy that leads, sympathy that draws us on with an invisible hand, beckoning, persuading, illuminating all things with her smile. She knows the heart's desire. She divines a simple longing, for she is that longing, going ever outward through the doors of sense. And she seeks until she finds, until she finds her mate. And then together they return to you and enter. And you three are one. Of such is sympathy, the liveliest tenant of the heart. And then this was the idea of seeing and listening that I'd read before. And I was going to say, I think, I know Rupali is the teacher, but I think we should have a homework assignment that uh, especially because it's the start of spring, I think we should all make a point to go out and see and listen to nature and, and come back and report on what it is that we, we see and experience in, in honor of Louis Sullivan. I like that. Wonderful, wonderful. So I want to give you a preview of the story of this book. So what is going to happen is that the next section, we're going to continue building. Um, you know, we started out by Louis Sullivan dismantling some of the ideas that were holding him back. And then now he's slowly kind of building. And then, so that's the, the building continues for the next reading, okay, from professor to summer. And then the student is going to go away to the countryside and he's going to write a letter back. Now that's a very important thing. And it's like you take in things and then he goes and he communes with nature and with himself. And he writes back 
and then he comes back to continue. So that's that's how the, the transitions are. All right, folks. So fantastic presentations, great questions, great discussion. Uh, we'll see you, see you soon. See you next time again at 2.30. Bye. Bye. Bye.